Good morning, everyone. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name's Robin Jacobs. I'm the Director of Strategic Legal Services Projects at Community Law Center. I'm also an adjunct here at University of Maryland um, and an alum here, so <laughs> I have many connections. Um, I am really excited about this first session. Um, I feel like the first question you always ask if you're a lawyer is, what form is this going to take? <laughs> so um, we have Kelsey Ripper, who um, is at the Lawyers Alliance in New York uh, as an e Equal Justice Works Fellow. For those of you non-lawyers in the room, um, the Equal Justice Works Fellow is an extremely prestigious, you know, cream of the crop type people. So I, I'm very excited because I know they pick the best um, lawyers to kind of start out their careers um, as Equal Justice Works Fellows. So um, we, uh, it's nice we have a small group, so hopefully that'll give us some time for questions and, and that sort of thing. Um, I actually used to do the starting a nonprofit workshop at Community Law Center for a few years, so I've offered to kind of help with the Maryland law side of things to the extent there's questions about that. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and turn it over because I know when I used to do this presentation it would take me two hours and we have an hour and a half. So um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Kelsey. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, so I, when I do this, um, I generally do it in two hours as well. So it'll be a little condensed um, and a little bit higher level because I also want to cover a couple other things um, and talk about employment law a little bit at the end. Um, but I do think it's really worth going around really quickly and just doing introductions, just so I know who's in the room, because um, we have lawyers, non-lawyers, community groups, everything. So I just want to see kind of where everyone's at. Um, so maybe if you could just introduce yourself, um, say where you're from. It's good to know what state you're coming from. And then also um, just quickly kind of your interest in urban agriculture, um, if you're on the, the lawyer end and counseling clients, or if you could be a potential client or you're starting your own farm, something like that. Um, and we'll just keep it kind of brief so we can get through them fairly quickly. Um, do you want to just start on this side after Robin? Do you want to just start? Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm in Blast Community. I'm with the state of Maryland. Um, I'm Dario Harris. I'm with uh, Johns Hopkins Center for Local Future. Um, I run the Baltimore Food and Bake Project. Okay. Uh, my name is Watch. I currently work at Real Food Farm, um, I'm from Baltimore. I work at Real Food Farm and I will be starting my own Petalotto Farm next season, so I'm really excited about this session. My name is Hutch Robbins, I live in Annapolis, but I, uh, I'm a lawyer at Miles and Stock right down the street. Hi, I'm Molly McCullough, I'm the education coordinator at Real Food Farm. I'm Claire Sheldon, I'm a third year law student. I'm Michelle Sparco. I'm from Durham, North Carolina. Um, I am the policy director at the Carolina Farm Stewardship Association and have big dreams of someday opening my own practice doing exactly this kind of work for urban farmers in my area. Okay. You're a law student here? Oh, no, I've been practicing law for a decade. Think so. <laughs> You're like 23 years old. <laughs> I work here in the IT department of the law school, and if anyone needs any help with technology, can't do wireless or anything, just let me know. Uh, oh, good. I'm so glad you're saying this. <laughs> and, sorry. Oh, um, good morning. I'm Dan Kugler. Um, I'm at the University of Maryland at College Park and have the lead in the Agricultural Law Education Initiative. Great. 
So um, I just wanted to, just, I'll give you my introduction too. I know Robin did a great job. But, um, so Lawyers Alliance uh, for New York is a nonprofit. We assist other nonprofits with their transactional legal needs. Um, our clients are all medium and small, small nonprofits working in low income communities in New York City. Um, we have uh, about 16 staff attorneys and we do, uh, we work on a co-counsel uh, basis, or 16 attorneys, several of them are staff attorneys, um, and we work on a co-counsel basis. So about 75% of our cases we co-counsel with pro bono attorneys, uh, and about 25% we co or we counsel in-house. Um, and I work in the urban health initiative, uh, which is kind of a, a focus outreach area, which um, includes uh, healthy living, aging in place, environmental health, and food security. And I really focus on the food security um, because as Robin mentioned, I'm an Equal Justice Works Fellow, so I have funding just to work with um, food justice and urban agriculture uh, nonprofits, um, which is fantastic, and I'm very excited about that and represent several farms uh, in New York. Uh, we are, yes, okay, I think that's it. Um, so just to kind of overview what we'll be talking about entity selection, much more to focus on nonprofits because that's what I do at Lawyers Alliance um, and also because that's what a lot of urban agriculture groups are doing, um, especially in New York where their farm size is a little bit smaller, they're focusing much more on charitable and educational programming. Um, so a lot of nonprofits in the urban agriculture field, but we'll also go through some of the other um, for-profit structures. <laughs> and we'll talk about governance and partnerships and employment law as well, um, which is a lot. So we do have to kind of move through things, but at the same time, I really would love this, for this to be a discussion and for people to, you know, pipe up with questions or just comments or ideas um, so that it can be uh, a very interactive uh, workshop. Okay, so here's the... Sorry, this is also my first time using a Prezi. I went away from the standard PowerPoint, so you might have to bear with me a little bit. And hopefully no one gets motion sickness from all the zooming, because <laughs> I, I was starting to get that when I was putting together. Um, okay, so let's talk about entity selection first. Um, so what is, entity, what is an entity? It's a separate, it's when you create a separate legal identity um, so it's not just yourself. You create a corporation that's able to have contracts. It's able to take out money. So you're able to do things through that corporation, and we'll talk about some of the benefits to that um, and it's, uh, in a, just a second. Um, so most organizations that come to us usually have some catalyst for wanting to become a, their own entity, and a lot of times that's money. For especially for nonprofits, they want to go after grants, they want to go after foundation money, um, and they need to be a, generally a 501c3 to do that. So they say, how do we do that? And we guide them through that process, and we'll go through it today. Um, other times, people come and they say, we have this plot of land, we want to get a lease, or we want to apply for a license um, with an agency or something like that. And people don't want to do that in their own name, um, so they want to be able to do that through the entity. So that's why they come. Um, come to us. Or they are starting to do a lot of public events, they're starting to invite people onto property and starting to realize that they're going to have liability issues. Uh, and that's one thing that we um, counsel people on. Um, so what I do when people come in though is I really like them to take a step back um, and determine whether they're really ready to incorporate um, and what exactly it is that they're trying to do. Um, and the answers to these questions um, really help guide us into letting to counseling people on what type of entity is really best for them. So what are your purposes or goals? What do you want to do with this organization? Do you want to do programming do you, for kids? Do you want to teach people about nutrition? Um, do you want to provide healthy food to people? Do you want to sell food for people? Are you trying to alleviate um, food inequality in a neighborhood? Um, and what kind of activities are you going to do um, to to reach that goal? And also, I ask people to think about your relationship to the organization. Um, as founders, um, you want to know. We want to know how you envision your relationship with the organization. Are you? Do you want to lead this organization? Um, do you? Are you looking for an empl employment? Um, you know, these things are helpful in determining whether you should go with the for-profit 
or the nonprofit route. And it's really important to think about these things as early as possible. It is possible to switch between nonprofits and for profits, but it's very difficult and it's much easier if you kind of think about these things at the beginning um, rather than when you already have taken on money and already have programs running and things like that. Um, so you're not beholden, but it's really great to, to know as early as possible. So you think you want to go with the for profit or the nonprofit route. Um, so let's look at kind of the pros and cons of the, of the nonprofit model. So the advantages are um, you have limited liability for your directors, officers, and members. So that means that your personal assets are not um, going to be, are not at stake. So if there's creditors coming, um, you don't have to worry about your own personal assets. If someone slips and falls on the um, prop, on a garden property or a farm property, you are not going to be held personally liable um, if, you, if there's a lawsuit. There's a few exceptions to that, but we can talk about that in a minute. And generally, that's why people are, go, are incorporating is for that limited liability. Um, you, it facilitates the process of applying for tax exemption. So creating a nonprofit creates the legal entity, but um, tax exemption is a federal um, status, and you apply to the IRS for that, um, and then you're able to go and apply for tax exemption to your state and local governments. Um, so that generally you have to be incorporated as a nonprofit in order to apply then for tax exemption. And it may help generate revenues. Just as I said, a lot of um, organizations, there's a lot of foundation money and grant money out there, but they're not going to just give it to you personally. They need, they need to make sure that they're giving it to a 501c3 um, or some other type of tax exempt entity. Um, the disadvantages are that it can be time consuming and restrictive. So there are a lot of regulations that you have to abide by when you are a nonprofit and when you have tax exempt status. Um, these are organizations that are serving the public and you're entrusted with public money. And so um, the governments want to make sure that you are using that money correctly. And that means that um, you have a lot of reporting obligations uh, that you have to abide by and, and some rules that you have to abide by. And of course, it won't automatically generate revenue. Just because you are a nonprofit doesn't mean people are going to knock at your door and start um, handing you money, unfortunately. It's still a lot of work. <laughs> okay, so for profit considerations. Um, you also get limited liability for, with most um, for profit forms, uh, again, so that your personal assets are not at risk. Um, you can have more control over the organization, um, especially as a founder. Your response, you have, you can make decisions rather than um, on your own, rather than having to go to a board of directors, which we'll talk about. And then there are some what less restrictive regulations on for profits and less oversight, um, depending on your the uh, entity you choose. And then you can, you can generate profits and pay them out to yourself and to your partners and to the other people that have invested in the business. So if you want to make money a lot and, and more than just a reasonable salary and you really want to, this to really generate some revenue for you, um, then you probably are going to want to go for the for-profit model. Um, and then you, if you don't feel like doing charitable and educational programs, say you just want to grow food and sell it to people, that's fine, but um, and that's great, but you're not really doing a charitable or education acti educational activity, so um, you're going to want to go for the for-profit um, route. And we'll talk about um, ways that for-profits and nonprofits can work together um, and, and do kind of both the, the for-profit um, growing of food and then also um, the educational charitable programs. Yeah? I have a good question. Um, I was, someone told me that there's a type of Yeah, that is true. So we'll go through that too with the um, for-profit. That's a, a low-profit limited liability corporation. Um, and we'll, yeah, let me, can I get back to that? Okay, okay when we go through. Because it's, it's an interesting model. Um, it's like, it's a little bit up for debate. Um, and actually some states in North Carolina have actually just abolished their um, low-profit liability corporation um, because there's a little bit of question as to its usefulness. Um, but we'll talk about that. Okay, oh, sorry. 
Okay. Did the wrong button. All right, sorry. Now we're going to get seasick. Okay. <laughs> I won't do that again. Sorry. <laughs> Don't look. <laughs> it's like in the IMAX, just like close your eyes <laughs> and the feeling will pass. Um, okay. <laughs> So you think you want to become a, a nonprofit corporation. Um, so that's really a function of the state. So the, as Robin mentioned before, the um, process is a little bit different in every state. Um, but generally, they, it's pretty similar. Um, and in New York and Maryland are actually pretty similar from the research that I did, a little bit more similar than, say, like California. Um, so you are incorporating and you're going to, what you're saying is that you um, are forming for non-pecuniary purposes. So you're not doing this just to make a profit. You can generate revenue and use that revenue for certain things, but you can't um, pay out the shareholders the way you would in a corporation. Um, instead of shareholders, you have directors. So um, you need to have a board of directors. Um, and we'll talk about that some more. Um, so nonprofits are governed by the corporation laws of their state. So for profit corporation law, we have a business corporation law and then the nonprofit corporation law. In Balt in Maryland, it's the same, correct? It's, a, it's a just a section. Stock is the version in Maryland. Okay. Um, and so what you're going to do is you're going to um, fill out a certificate of incorporation. Sometimes it's articles of incorporation, articles of association, things like that. Depends on the name for the state. Um, and they're pretty standard. Uh, you know, you can usually this Department of State's, the Department of State is who you're going to apply for to create your business entity. And a lot of times they have um, model certificate of incorporations. Um, generally, you're going to state your name. Uh, so make sure that your name hasn't already been taken. The Department of States have databases to make to, so you can check to see that someone already doesn't have that name. Um, in New York, you can reserve a name, although it's not usually necessary. Uh, and if you aren't ready to incorporate, you can still reserve the name. Generally, don't recommend that since it's not necessary. Um, and then you're just going to state that you are formed for non-pecuniary purposes. Sometimes that's enough. So um, the, in New York, you used to have to have up till a couple months ago, used to have some type of specific purpose um, to address food insecurity, um, and this is how we're going to do it. Uh, in New York, they just changed that, so you only have to say whether you're a charitable or non-charitable uh, nonprofit. And I think it's like that in Maryland as well. You can just say you're charitable. Um, yeah, we usually advise to put more specific purposes. Yeah, so, yeah, right. So that's kind of a debate now in, in uh, New York, now that we're allowed to only put charitable. Um, it's kind of, we haven't decided whether it's great just to put the charitable or to have some a little bit more significant purposes. Sometimes funders like to see it, um, and the IRS might like to see it as well. Um, usually you have to put uh, your directors as well. So for New York on the certificate of incorporation, you have to have three directors. Um, for Maryland, one, correct? Uh, you should really have three. But we do, okay. <laughs> you can have one in a lot of states. Not a best practice. There are certain legal minimums, but we generally always tell people about the best practices. So it's not a great idea to start a nonprofit with only one person that's involved in this. You know, if you are really looking to for this to really take off and be become an, an asset to the community, you need more buy-in than just yourself. You need to reach out to other people and make sure that other people are on the same page and are really invested in this with you. Um, so definitely minimum of three is uh, suggested. You have to fill the officer roles in Maryland. You have to have more than one. So. Okay, yeah. Um, and also, I don't know if any, most funders and grant makers are going to look ask you for your board of directors. And if they see that you only have one board of director, probably not going to get that grant. Um, and then you want to make sure that you have the IRS language in there. And there's certain IRS language that um, you need in order to apply for a tax exemption. And in a lot of times, model documents that the Department of State's come out with don't even have the IRS language, So, which is frustrating because then when they go to apply for a tax exemption and the IRS says, no, you need this language, you have to go back and amend your certificate of incorporation. So you want to make sure that you have um, that language in there. And then um, 
we always get this the Delaware question. Um, I don't know if you get it in Maryland because it's not. Maybe it's easier in New York. It was very. It was difficult to uh, incorporate, and it kind of was time consuming. So a lot of people said, "Oh, I heard that the, if you incorporate in Delaware, it's a lot easier. It's a lot faster," and that's somewhat true. It was faster, but um, it's. We, ne we usually advise against it. Usually we're working with small community groups that are really focused on the state that they're operating in. Um, and they have to, you have to abide by the same laws in your state anyway um, and jump through the same hoops in the state if you're operating there. And then also you have to have a cert an agent in Delaware to receive process um, if, you, for, if you're getting lawsuit or sued or something like that. Uh, and it usually costs money to pay for an agent in Delaware. So. I guess it's not a problem in Maryland. It's a bit, I get that question every single time we talk about incorporation in New York. Um, okay. And then once you're ready with your certificate of incorporation, you will submit it to the Department of State in your state. And uh, it should take sometimes days, usually in New York. Um, sometimes it takes weeks. But, uh, okay, so once you're incorporated, your next step is going to be to have an organizational meeting. Uh, and this is where you're going to get together. Um, you're going to elect your board of directors. Um, you're going to adopt your bylaws, um, maybe a conflict of interest policy, um, whistleblower policy and nepotism policies. Uh, usually, those are usually for a little bit of larger organizations, but small organizations have them as well. Um, so your board of directors, very important. Uh, again, you really should have uh, three board of directors uh, at minimum. Are there? I know one person said they were on a board. Is there other? Are there people on boards of nonprofits? Okay, or have been? Yeah, great. I always want to pitch to people. You really should think about becoming a director on a board. Um, nonprofits need good people on their boards. They need smart people. They need people that um, have accounting experience. <laughs> That's the one thing that people are always trying to find. Um, they need people that understand how to how to do accounting and over to do financial reports and things like that. So if you have that skill, please work with a nonprofit. Um, the so the the board of directors is really oversees the policies and major activities of the organization. It's kind of a higher level management. Um, although it can look very different for different organizations. Um, for small organizations, the board of, especially volunteer, all volunteer organizations, the board of directors is very involved. Um, you're making very even minute um, decisions. When you get to a little bit higher than you're up, when your organization starts having staff, then they're really dealing with the day-to-day -day operations. But you are really overlook, overseeing major decisions um, over new program areas or priority areas, uh, making sure that the organization is fulfilling its mission. So you might be looking at employment policies or you might be hiring the executive director um, or uh, we'll say oh, reviewing your financial statements. That's a big one. Um, you'll, the board of directors will review the tax exemption application before it goes out, things like that. Um, I'm on a board that is an all-volunteer organization, uh, and we were talking about, for an urban farm in New York, and we were talking about which beds we were gonna, like what we need to plan the beds to winterize them. That's how minute we were getting. So it can be a range. Um, and, but then for Lawyers Alliance, when I go to their board meetings, it's much, much higher level. You know, it's a much larger organization. So um, they're talking about a lot of times how to raise money. And so you wanna be strategic about how you develop your board. And you want to make sure you're grabbing from several different skill sets. Um, and when you get higher level, you one of the main skill sets is going to be fundraising. Um, so you can, some boards are very much about fundraising, but you still need to be able to um, oversee the activities of the organization and really take care, because you have to abide by these three things, the duty of care, duty of loyalty, except loyalty is not spelled right there. <laughs> I did not notice that. Uh, and duty of obedience. Um, so the duty of care is that making sure that you are going to meetings. Are you asking questions? Are you reviewing the financial statements and the uh, materials that go out before the board meeting? Um, 
if you, you make sure that you are abiding by the duty of loyalty. So we all have competing loyalties. So we have loyalties to um, maybe the board that we're on, but also the company that we work for. So you want to make sure that the decisions that you are making are in the best interest of the organization um, that you're on the board of directors with. Um, and then the duty of obedience is um, just making sure that you are staying true to the mission of the organization. And if you follow all these things, then you're not going to have to worry about the liability issue. Um, it's very hard to really go after someone's personal assets, um, and it's very rare. So as long as you're, you know, making sure that you do these things, then you're going to be, then limited liability will, will um, you'll be covered by the limited liability. Twice now, I've heard that you know, limited liability, no problem. But lots of times, the the granting agency or public or federal dollars come with liability, personal liability attached to it. So you have to accept that, even though know, your board is set up in such a way that you think you don't have liability. I have not run into that problem. Um, I mean, I, I I have run into the issue. There are always exceptions mm -hmm. <laughs> in the law. Um, so. For instance, if the organization does not pay its taxes, I mean, the IRS can come after the board personally. So um, it's important that the board take those duties very seriously, review those grant agreements so that they know what the organization, what they personally are signing on for. And this is the reason a lot of organizations try to cover directors, have directors and officers liability insurance. I don't know if that's part of yeah. what you're talking about, but that, will, that would help fund in the instance where there is a problem, um, then then that would come in and kind of help help fund the lawyer that might need to be hired to represent an individual to, that's yeah. on the board serving as a volunteer. Yeah, one thing that we put in our bylaws usually is um, it, it gives the organization the authorization to purchase um, directors and officers insurance, um, and so. DNO insurance, and a lot of times when you ask someone to be on the board, they'll say, "Oh, do you have DNO insurance?" And that will, while a lot of times the lawsuits you're not able to get to the personal assets, um, and you usually have a defense. At least the directors and officers insurance will pay for that defense, um, and a lot of people also use it for some employment law claims, as well. Um, so at your organizational meeting, you're going to adopt your bylaws, um, and you have to do that before you apply for your tax exemption. So the bylaws are really um, governing the operation of the board. So it's going to explain how the board's made up, how many directors you have. Uh, we generally recommend that you have an odd number of board members so that you don't have a gridlock. Um, we usually you say the length of the director's term of office, so it could be one year or two years. Um, New York has a cap of five years, although there's no limit on how long you can be on the board. You just have to um, renew after five years if, you're, if you have a five-year limit. Um, and then you're going to establish your executive and other standing committees of the board. The executive committee is usually made up of your core officers, so your president, your secretary, your treasurer, a vice president, um, and they can make, they can also make decisions that don't need the consultation of the entire board. Um, how you're going to remove directors, um, how, uh, what your officers are going to be and what their duties are um, to the, or their obligations are to the organization. Um, again, president, secretary, treasurer, main ones, a lot of times people have vice presidents. Um, and then there's, you can pretty much create other offices as you see fit. Um, and then your quorum requirements, how many people do you need to be at a meeting in order for them to have to, to make official decisions that bind the corporation. Um, and procedures and notice requirements for meetings and board members. When do you have to send out materials? How much notice do you need to give to directors um, when you call a board meeting? And then we talked about the officers uh, and directors insurance. Um, this is a big topic. Um, it gets confusing to people um, when we talk about membership and non-membership um, uh, nonprofits. So, in so usually you can decide if you want to have a membership or non-membership organization. Some types of organizations require non-membership, 
or require membership. So um, in New York, if you are a non-charitable nonprofit, uh, then you will be a you have to be a member or a membership organization. Um, a lot of people ask me what's the difference, what's a charitable nonprofit, and what's a non-charitable nonprofit. So a charitable nonprofit is when you have um, educational and charitable activities that are open to the public. They're um, they're outwardly facing. They're not just for the benefit of the of the people working working within the organization. So if you have um, say a garden club that's just the garden club that just has members. You're not open to the public. You don't have educational programs um, or anything that's outwardly facing. Then you are really not a charitable organization. You're not going to. You're not going to um, qualify for um, 501c3 tax exemption. You, you can qualify for other types of tax exemption, which we we'll talk about. Um, so, the members for a nonprofit, if you have members, is that. They're above the board of directors. They're going to be the people that are um, making decisions about major decisions. So if you're going to sell a lot of assets, or if you're going to change um, the certificate of incorporation, or you're going to make large corporate changes like a merger or something like that, you would have to go to the membership for that. Um, and they and then they elect the board of directors. But you don't need to have that um, necessarily. And and we generally try to steer people away from membership um, organizations because they can add a lo level of bureaucracy that can be a little bit um, constrictive to the organization. And we find that a lot of times when people set up membership organizations, they come to us 10 years later and have a big decision that needs to go to the membership and they don't have a membership list and they don't know where people are and how to get a hold of them. So it's kind of a mess. Um, and you have to kind of figure out what to do in that situation. And the, um, there was another thing about numbers that I was talking about. I don't remember. Um, so, oh, but sometimes people like the membership organization because it lends itself to having, to the appearance of a more democratic organization that there's really a lot of member buy-in. Um, and that's really important for some organizations and that's great. They just need to know that they need to keep track of membership lists and that they're going to have this extra thing that they need to do when, um, they, they, when they make, want to make very large decisions or when they're electing their board of directors. Um, so the board of directors then are, is, your lar is your governing organization or your body of governance. They're really overseeing the major policies of the organization. Um, and then they're uh, underneath them if you have an executive director. Um, or staff and volunteers um, that they're overseeing um, th that operation. Okay. So, um, oh, conflict of interest policy. Um, so, in New York, now you have to have a conflict of interest policy. Um, and I'll explain that that is uh, the IRS tax exemption application asks if you have a conflict of interest policy. You don't have to have one for the IRS, but they ask you, and that's their way of making sure that you have one. Um, <laughs> their polite way of requiring it. Um, so it's really recommended. Also, a lot of funders and think people want to see it too. Um, if you're getting state and um, federal contracts, you have to have a conflict of interest policy. Sorry, I just saw that your hand. <laughs> I have a question. Mostly about how do you work with clients in kind of an organizational structure, membership versus non-members? Um, I have some limited experience working with organizations. And in that limited experience already, I've seen people coming to the table with um, very new ideas about, you mentioned uh, democratic governance. And so that seems to be the hot thing mm -hmm. in social activism right now. It's not just democratic governance, but incredibly decentralized right. decision-making processes. And, I want, and, and for better or worse, that's just not something that corporate and nonprofit law seems to have caught up to account for. Mm -hmm. So I, I was wondering how do you talk to clients uh, and kind of say, okay, well, there's a, there's a mismatch here. And, and what do you tell them and, and how do you advise them uh, to, to reconcile that, that mismatch? I say a lot of what you just said, that um, th these are, we, uh, this is a great idea and that this, the democratic process is something to be valued and we, let's try to make it a part of the organization, but there are certain minimums that you have to meet in order to 
appease the government, and unfortunately that's the way it is a lot of times, and the IRS, and they need to see certain things. Um, and if people really want to be a membership organization, then they should be a membership organization. If they're really gung-ho about it, you know, I've had a client, several conversations with a client um, over the last few months, and, and there's just been discord among the, member, among the board members about whether they really should be a uh, membership or a non-membership organization. And, and generally, the, the idea of the additional bureaucracy of it kind of turns people away because they know that they're not going to be able to make decisions as quickly. Um, but for some organizations, that's okay. And we have a lot of ways to make decisions now. We can use email and things like that. So um, it's not quite as restrictive as maybe it was um, 15 or 20 years ago. So I don't want to necessarily discourage people all the time from being a membership organization. I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts on that. I have a question, actually. Do you ever, as an alternative, suggest one of the cooperative forms? Yeah, so I we don't do cooperatives at um, Lawyers Alliance, so and then we'll talk about it a little bit. But yeah, there are people in New York that do it, and we generally will recommend that they talk to um, someone about doing a cooperative um, in, instead of doing the non the, the traditional nonprofit. Um, so the conflict of interest policy is um, a policy which explains what to do in this situation where um, your generally your directors uh, have a conflict um, and that means that they have um, that they could be it could result in personal benefit to them so um, for example a lot of th this happens a lot and, it, and conflicts aren't always bad it's just they have to be disclosed um, and, and certain actions have to be taken once there is a conflict um, so say a board member or, is, run, is on the board of a, a food justice organization, has an urban farm, they're having a big event, they want to have food at the event, um, and they want to, and one of the board members owns a restaurant and says, oh, you know what, I can provide all the food, I'll just do it at cost, you know, it, it won't, it'll be this much money. Um, and that sounds great, you know, oh, wow, we'll get it for so much cheaper than if we went to some other restaurant and got food. Um, but it could, but you have to look at that with scrutiny and because that board member owns that restaurant and you have to make sure that um, the decision that to use that restaurant is in the best interest of the organization. Um, and so that means that you have, that he needs to disclose, this is, I own this restaurant, you know, I make a profit off of it. Um, and then he won't be involved in that decision whether to use the restaurant or not. Um, he needs to usually remove himself from the meeting at some point you know he'd be there and say this is what I um, this is what I can offer but generally has to leave so that they can vote and say okay we're gonna go go with this person's um, restaurant and also required in some places and best practices if not uh, is to check and just to make sure other like that, that this is the best deal for the organization um, and so checking and prices and things like that to make sure that it's uh, everything drives and it makes it, it is the best decision. And in New York, you have to um, now disclose every time you are elected to the board and then every year after, uh, you have to actually fill out a form that says these are my interests, you know, I own this company, um, and so that way that the, everyone's on, on the board knows, you know, where your interests lie. Um, and then the whistleblower policy is now a requirement in New York, but um, over, but only for certain large organizations. Um, and then the nepotism policy, you know, making sure that no one, everyone's, someone's not like hiring every one of their family members. So, uh, okay. So once you have all of those things in place, oh, and I just wanted to mention um, minutes too. So making sure that your board members or your board meetings, um, someone's taking the minutes, usually the secretary, and uh, and that's important for the conflict of interest too. So if someone says, I have a conflict, you know, making sure that you note that in the minutes. Uh, and the minutes don't have to be a verbatim, you know, this person said exactly this, this person said exactly that. It's just in general, this is what we talked about, um, this is what we voted on, there was this conflict was raised. Um, that should all be in the minutes, and you should make sure you keep them because that's something that doesn't happen all the time. <laughs> it can be a pain. 
Um, okay, so, f oh, yeah. It's a quick question about Phoenix. Have you had much success um, with people recording meetings? I mean, especially now it's just you just set up a, a little kind of like a GoPro or an iPhone. Is that something that people do? Um, no, and I think it might actually not be. It depends on the state, but in the state you need. In Maryland, you need consent oh, to okay. really record. You know, I mean, if you had everyone saying yes, you could. Okay. You need I would also say yeah. that's not a good way of, no. of minutes because the minutes should just reflect the actions taken by the organization. They shouldn't be like a verbatim retrospective. Everything that yeah. happened. Yeah, that's, yeah, generally not a good idea. <laughs> um, so if, if you, once you've done all that, then you can be ready to apply for federal tax exemption. Um, and there's actually, when we talk about tax exemption, a lot of times people are talking about 501c3, um, but there's actually 27 different ta types of tax exemption. Um, there's a few that we'll talk about today. I'll also talk about C4 and C5. Um, but C3 is kind of that brass ring that allows you to offer donors tax-deductible donations. Um, so that's the one that a lot of people go for. Um, also, because a lot of grants and foundations um, will only give money to 501c3s, uh, so that's generally what people go for. But if you decide that you want to be 501c3, you're going to have to meet certain standards and you're going to have um, report, like significant reporting requirements. So in order to be a 501c3, you have to be organized um, for ex and operated exclusively for these purposes. And I highlighted the charitable and educational because those are generally the ones that we're talking about, um, especially with urban agriculture. Although I haven't seen it, but scientific maybe, um, especially if you're doing work around remediation and things like that, so soil remediation. So if you are not doing charitable and educational things, then you are not going to qualify for 501c3. Um, and charitable means that you have to be doing something that serves a certain need that is, so it's, if you're, un, if you're lessening the burdens of government, um, if you're serving like relief of the poor, um, low income communities, things like that. Um, that is going to be charitable, uh, and educational is like pretty broad. So a lot of if you're doing nutrition classes and classes about how to grow food, um, that'll generally qualify um, as educational. And so the, when you're doing the tax exemption application, um, that's one of the main things that the IRS is looking for. The other part is that they're look, making sure that you are not um, that your earnings are not inuring to private benefit, so that um, somebody's not making. You know, you can have people have salaries and things like that, um, but they're but the purpose of the organization um, and the activities of the organization are not actually benefiting someone um, privately. Uh, and then there's this is the political activity. So if you are going to be 501c3, um, you have very there's limits on what you can do um, as far as public or political activity. Um, so there's an absolute ban on partisan political activity. So you cannot endorse candidates. You cannot do, do things that imply that you're endorsing candidates. Um, one problem that we've been having, I'm just sure it's happening other places too, is that candidates want to come to your event. You're having an event um, as a nonprofit. You know, people are coming to your space. Uh, and, the, and the politician thinks, oh, that's a great way to meet people and hand out some literature, you know, say, oh, I'm running for office. No, we, you cannot do that. Um, there are certain things you can do, like candidate forums and certain education um, initiatives around um, candidates, but it's very risky. Um, you have to be very neutral, and uh, you have to make sure that you're getting everyone involved. All the candidates have to be involved, or at least offered the opportunity to be involved. Um, so it's so, it's something that we really it's work hard with on with clients to make sure that they understand um, that you cannot have any partisan political activity. Um, but we do work a lot with the clients that do lobbying um, because you can do it. And lobbying sounds like that bad word that no one wants to talk about. But generally, we call it advocacy. <laughs> and it's when you are advocating for the passage of certain legislation, uh, both at the federal level, the state level, um, and city level, too. Um, but it does. If you are going to do lobbying, then there are certain filing requirements and things like that that you will need to do 
um, at all levels, federal, state, and sometimes city. So in New York City, you have to, um, if you do a certain level of lobbying, you have to report that to the city. Um, and there's, so if you are going to do lobbying, there are two ways to d determine whether you're doing too much lobbying or not enough lobbying. So when um, the first one is the insubstantial part test, which was the only test that the IRS had for a while, and it was that if, you're, if your lobbying is insubstantial, then uh, you can, then you're okay. If it becomes substantial, then you're not okay. And if you go to this, and if it becomes substantial, the only thing the IRS can do is take away your tax exemption. So people thought, that's not very clear. Like, that's very gray. What do you mean, what's insubstantial? People th said, oh, 49% of our activities are our, um, our expenses, that's, that's insubstantial because it's not 50, it's not 51. Uh, other people said 15%, 10%, it was all over the place. And the IRS could only with, um, take away your tax exemption. So they came out with what's called the 501H election. And that is a bright line rule um, that allows organizations to know if they're actually going to go over the, the limit. And it depends on your expenditures. Um, so if you look at the, t at the different thresholds, if you're spending, spending this much money and this percentage of it is going towards lobbying, and if it's under the threshold, then you're fine. Um, and if you go over it, then they actually have, instead of just removing your or taking away your tax exemption, they can actually um, just impose a, a penalty tax on you. Uh, and that's 25% of the amount that you go over. And it's on a four-year average, too. So that way they could penalize you without pulling your entire tax exemption. Um, and when you're thinking about those expenditures, uh, volunteers don't count for those expenditures, um, but staff time does. So if you have staff that's meeting with the politicians about on certain legislation points, um, even if it's things like, oh, we want to pass legislation around allowing people to have bees or chickens or greenhouses on their roofs, um, then that would be lobbying. Um, if you're telling them, we really would like you to pass this legislation, um, let me teach you about this legislation, uh, then that's lobbying or advocacy, as we call it. Um, any questions about that? Okay, so if you are applying for 1023, or if you're applying for a 501c3 tax exemption, you're going to use the 1023 form. Um, so, so the first thing you want to do is you apply for an employer identification number. Very simple. It takes five minutes. Um, it's all online. And then you're going to do what takes a lot longer, is filling out the 1023 application. And, um, and you need to also include your certificate of incorporation and your bylaws. So the significant parts of the um, 1023 application are your narrative description. So that's where you're going to talk about all the activities that you've done, all the activities you're currently doing, and all the activities that you plan to do in the future. And this is really where, you're going to, where it's going to become clear that you're doing charitable work. So if you're an urban agriculture organization and you're running a farm, you really want to be, differentiate, differentiate yourself from a traditional commercial farm. So yes, I'm growing food, but I'm doing these other programs. I'm, working, I'm going to work with kids. I'm going to work with schools to bring kids onto the, the farm and teach them about farming. I'm going to um, sell produce in low-income areas that don't have um, access to fresh food, uh, you know, things, nutrition education programs. So you need to really highlight those charitable activities or educational. Uh, and then the other part that takes a little bit of time is your budget so, uh, and your financials. So depending on how long you've been in existence, you have to do um, past financials, then you have to do projected future financials. So um, that takes organizations a little bit of time to do. Um, once you are ready, once your 1023 is done um, and ready to submit, then you submit it to the IRS. Uh, it is about, it's depending on the little money symbol got removed. Um, it's $400 if you have $10,000 or less uh, and project to make less than $10,000, but it's $850. Um, if you are going, if you plan to exceed ten thousand uh, dollars, and then the next thing is to wait. Um, so, the 
IRS was taking forever to, to, um, to process tax exemption applications. Um, for some, it was taking a year. Some of it was, if there was a little bit of confusion or questions, it was taking over a year. Um, they've actually sped it up quite a bit recently. Um, so they have been getting back within a few months for some organizations. It depends on how complicated your organization is and if it's very clear, oh yeah, this is a charitable and educational organization, I understand what this is, um, then it'll come back quicker. If they have questions, they'll come back and you have to submit additional information and answers to their questions. Um, but we got one back recently that was just a couple months. Um, so it was, uh, they're definitely changing things with IRS. Um, once you, if you file your application for exemption within 27 months of your incorporation, you will get your, your tax <coughs> exemption will be retroactive to the day of your incorporation. So, um, which can be very helpful. Uh, especially if you, so if you are soliciting money from people and you are waiting for your tax exemption application to go through, you cannot, you have to tell them, I don't have tax exemption yet. I'm in the process of applying for it. And if I get it, I'm gonna let you know. And so then you can deduct those taxes. Um, or if they really want to, they can go back and amend their old um, tax returns in order to claim the deduction. Um, but you have to be honest with people that you don't have it yet. Um, but then if you do get it and they've donated since your type of time of incorporation, then those, that donation might become tax exempt or tax deductible. Um, if you apply for your tax exemption after 27 months of, of, since you've been incorporated, um, it's just retroactive to the date of um, filing the 1023. And so then there's the 1023-EZ, which was just released um, by the IRS this summer. It is um, their way of streamlining this process. They know that they had a backlog. They really wanted to be able to spend more time reviewing longer 1023s and also to, work, to spend more um, time and effort on enforcement and really monitoring organizations. So they came out with the 1023EZ, which is self-certification, um, saying, you know, I'm doing charitable and educational activities. I qualify for 1023, I qualify um, as a 501c3. You don't have to do the narrative statement. You don't have to do the financials. It's three pages. It's very quick. Um, the organizations that have qualified for it, though, um, are organizations that are making, that project revenue of less than $50,000 per year or have not, and, and have not been making any more than $50,000 per year, or you have assets of less than $250,000. Uh, and there's a few other organizations that are not qualified, and there's a helpful worksheet on the back of the, um, the instructions to the 1023EZ, which will very, you can pretty quickly decide whether you, you're qualified for not, qualified or not. And um, for both the 1023EZ and the 1023, the instructions from the IRS are actually quite helpful. Um, they're long, but they are really helpful and they give examples, um, so I think that that's a great resource for you to use. Um, if you're trying to do this on your own or do it for clients <coughs> for the first time. Uh, the cost for the 1023 easy is the same um, for the regular form. And we, and I do think there's a lot of value in doing the full 1023. Um, it really makes clients think about what is this organization doing? What are the activities gonna be? And makes them kind of realize that the significance of what they're doing, um, you know, that, that if they're board members, they're going to take their, these things seriously. And um, once you get your 1020, your tax exemption, you're going to do what you need to to make sure that you are you don't lose it um, because that form is a pain, and so you don't want to do it again. Um, because if you lose your tax exempt status, you have to do it again, and you have to wait again. So um, I think there's some differing opinions among attorneys who do 1023s about whether to use the 1023 easy or not. And if you don't, if you, the organization's kind of on the line, you're not sure, oh, maybe it's 1023, maybe it's easy, it could qualify for the easy, maybe it wouldn't, I would suggest doing the 1023, the full 1023. Um, any questions about that? Okay, so one thing that you'll have to do on the 1023 um, is you'll have to say whether you're a public charity or a 
Public Foundation, um, which has, it's a classification that actually has significant um, impacts on, on the organization. So what it is, it's, it depend, it's a classification um, regarding where your income's coming from uh, and your financial support. So if you are demonstrating that you, um, a significant portion of the revenues, and we say about at least 10%, but really like a third, is coming from contributions um, from the public or government contracts, uh, then you're a public charity. But if you're, or, uh, most of your income or financial support is coming from you know, one or two people, um, like a company, then you are going to be a public foundation. And that's important because there's additional restrictions on foundations, it can't lobby. Um, you have to you have to pay some um, taxes on your investment income. Um, you can't compensate directors or officers, although a lot of nonprofits don't do that. Um, and you have to make certain dis percentage of distributions each year. And so you have to say whether you're a public charity or public foundation on your 1023. But then as you submit your um, 990s every year, if the IRS says, oh, look, you're really a public foundation now, they'll send you a letter and say, you've now been reclassified as a public foundation. And you can fight that if you want to, um, but it's not something you want to avoid or just be aware that if you start looking like a public foundation, you're going to have to have and become one, you're going to have to um, keep these other things in mind. So we don't really deal with public foundations as much. We, our clients are all public charities. Um, okay, so the 501c4. So there's, this is the other, one of the other tax exemption statuses you can have. Um, and we've, it's really become uh, much more buzzed about recently because a lot of the, like the political action committees, the PACs, there are 501c4s. Um, there are a lot of other 501c4s that aren't doing a lot of lobbying and things like that. It's just how they were set up originally. But um, there's kind of become this like stigma attached to them for some reason. Um, and so the 501c4s are not, you can, your donations are not tax deductible. Um, but if you don't qualify for 501c3, uh, you could qualify for a 501c4. Um, the, and your, your corporate income tax is, you're not going to pay corporate income tax, but you um, will not be able to offer taxable to deductible donations, and you may be limiting yourself um, as far as income for, from foundations um, and grants. But you can do an unlimited amount of lobbying. So you see that a lot of the lobbying groups, a lot of the advocacy groups that are doing significant amounts are doing, are, um, doing a 501c4 and you can actually do some amount of partisan political activity as well. And I'll just mention 501c5 labor organizations. So these are kind of like trade groups generally for agricultural organizations. I have one client that was a 501c5. They were a group of farmers in, in, a, in an area um, of upstate New York. Um, they had, it was a farmer networking group. They did um, events. It was really get to know everyone. Um, and work to, you know, to, to boost the visibility of food coming out of that um, geographical area. But then they started working with the local um, soup kitchens and local food pantries, and then they started wanting to work with kids, and they were doing work in New York City with um, schools and teaching children about you know sustainable food systems and their activity started to look a lot more like a charitable organization and they really were wanted to go after that after grant money and things like that um, so they really wanted to become a 501c3 um, and based on those their specific factors we decided it was probably easier to actually just start a 501c3 so they'll have two parallel organizations um, moving all the charitable activities into the 501c3 and then the activities that were really just benefiting the farmers would be in the C5, and most of those activities were going to be discontinued anyway and rolled into the C3. Um, so that can be an option too. If you, if you already are one type of um, tax exempt and then you want to do, if you really are moving into a different area, um, you can start a new, another organization, um, but you'll have to do 
you know, parallel books, or you'll have to do separate books, and you have to have separate boards, and things like that, so it can be a little confusing. So it's better to make that decision at the front end rather than having to, to do it later once you've already been established. Um, okay, so once you get your tax exemption, some people will think, oh great, I have my federal tax exemption, I'm ready to go. And they forget that they still need to apply a state and for a state and local tax exemptions, um, which are generally pretty quick and easy once you have that IRS determination letter saying that you're um, 501c3 tax exempt. And then you generally have there's other things that you might have to apply for, um, like the property tax exemptions uh, if you have property, uh, but just don't forget to do them. And then generally you have to register with your state attorney general who oversees um, non charitable organizations. Uh, in your state. So in New York, that's the Attorney General Charities Bureau. And you have to register with them and then file annual reports with them. So um, they want to know what's going on. Usually they want a copy of your 990. Um, so don't forget to do that. But very importantly, do not forget to do 990s. So 990s are your annual um, uh, report to the IRS. Um, it's not a tax return because you're not paying taxes, but um, you have to fill one out. They, if you do not fill one out for three years in a row, the organization will automatically lose their tax exemption. Um, so it's, there's, and there's no one sitting there saying, oh, look at this organization, they're doing such great things. It would be such a shame if they weren't tax exempt anymore. It's, that's not what happens. There's a computer that says, oh, they were supposed to file their 990 and, for, and they didn't do it for three years in a row. Automatic, done. So you, then you have to apply again. Um, so that's the pain. The 990s actually, some of them are very easy. If you aren't making very much money, it's a little postcard. It takes five minutes to do. Um, if you're making a little bit more money, you do the next step, step up, um, and it takes a little bit more time. And then if you're a larger organization, you have to do the full 990. We also recommend that you, or you need to do your 990s while you're waiting for your tax exemption. So if you've applied for your tax exemption um, in 2012, um, you should file in 20, your, um, your 990 when it's due. And it's due five months and 15 days after your, at the end of your fiscal year. So if your fiscal year ends December 31st, your, tax, your 990 would be due the um, May 15th. So make sure that you are doing that. Um, Okay. Why did that not go? Okay. So one of the options for organizations that are starting up, which is really helpful, and um, we recommend this to a lot of people, is to do a fiscal sponsorship. Um, so that's when you are con contracting with an organization that already has their tax exemption. Um, and they will, they will accept tax deductible donations on your behalf, and then they will use those ta those tax exempt monies to um, will give it to you, or will you will ask them for the money when you um, need it, and uh, you can carry on your programs and activities using tax deductible tax deductible donations um, that have been accepted by the fiscal sponsor. And the fiscal sponsor can have sponsorship can have a couple different forms. Um, sometimes it's really very intertwined with the, the sponsor. You are really a program of theirs, and others are doing kind of like a regrant situation um, where they're a little bit more hands off. Um, the IRS is, con is hesitant about organizations that are conduits. So it's not just like I'm going to take in the money and just give it to you. And it's just really they're just kind of taking it in and spitting it out. Although really, in practicality, like that's kind of what they're doing. Um, so uh, just don't ever call it a conduit. Um, and you have to have a mission match between the organizations. So you have to be making sure that you're not, your activities are furthering the exempt and charitable purposes of the, your sponsor. So that means that if you have a sponsor that's Really, they're doing HIV and AIDS awareness, and you have an urban farm, and you want to teach kids how to farm. Those missions don't really match, so that's not a good match for the organization. 
Um, if you're doing like a healing garden or something and you're doing work about foods that are good for people that have HIV, then maybe those would match um, and that would be okay. But you need to make sure that you're not going to some organization um, to be a fiscal sponsor who just really does not align with what you're trying to do. Uh, and then you want to make sure that you have an agreement. Um, you know, these relationships are great and they, some people stay in them, some organizations stay in them for years. Um, some just use it as a way to kind of bridge the time between when they uh, need to, when they apply for tax exempt status. Because that can take a while, although now it's less, maybe less necessary, although we'll see how, you know, if the IRS keeps up with it actually um, turning around applications quickly. Um, but they, but no matter what, you should have an agreement. And where we've seen fiscal sponsorships, relationships go south is where they didn't have an agreement. Um, not just so that you can, you know, if something goes bad, you can say, oh, I have this agreement, but it's just a good way for both organizations to sit down and really decide what the relationship is between this or our organizations and, um, you know, and, and make sure that if they, if you plan on going off on your own and doing this, and this is just kind of an incubator type situation, um, that they're okay with that and they know what types of things you're taking with them, with your, with you when you leave. Um, so one, so we definitely, in the fiscal sponsorship agreements, we want to include how money will be handled, uh, money, I have a lot of typos, sorry. Um, so how money will be handled, what happens when you need a reimbursement, how fast that reimbursement will be disper dispersed, um, and the big one is fees. So fiscal sponsors don't usually do this out of the, you know, out of, they, they generally would, are supportive of the project that you're doing and they think it's great, but it costs them time and money too. So usually they are going to charge you a fee of between 5 and 10% of all the money that they take in. So if you get a grant for $1,000 and you have a 10% fee, then they're going to take $100 off and you're only going to get $900. Um, and the fees vary depending on how much services that they're giving you. So if they're really just taking in money and then, and you know, reimbursing you for expenses and things like that, then your fees are probably going to be a little bit lower. But if they're doing a lot of back office stuff, they're helping you with your books, you have people on payroll, um, then they're going to be taking a higher fee from that. Um, and they might provide other services too, um, in general, supportive um, services such as like helping you with your accounting and helping you um, design programs and things like that. So it's good to talk about those things at the beginning and see kind of how involved they want to be. Um, and when it's time for to terminate, you know, how that's going to work and what they want, you know, they want to make sure that they've taken these, this money in um, under the auspices that it's a five, it's tax deductible, uh, it's a 501c3, so they can't just give it to anyone um, if once the relationship terminates, so they're going to usually wait till you get your own 501c3 and then um, transfer the money to you uh, or transfer it to another fiscal sponsor if you decide to go with a different fiscal sponsor, which does happen sometimes. So um, I, one thing I wanted to talk about a lot is um, generating income because that's something we all need to do as a for-profit and a non-profit. Um, but it's a little, it gets a little tricky when you're talking about non-profits and I think it's especially important for the urban agriculture groups because fundamentally you are, pre as an urban agriculture organization, you're creating a something that can be sold. And, um, and that's great, but we just need to be very careful about what, how it's sold, um, and the IRS is looking for, is looking to make sure that nonprofits, which has tax exemption, are not unfairly competing with um, commercial for profits um, when you're selling a similar product um, or service. So there are restrictions um, that you need to be aware of, and um, a lot of it has to do with the facts and circumstances of the activity. So it's just, it's, so kind of the purpose today is to give you a couple examples, but then also to, for you to think, oh, we're starting this new activity and it's gonna generate revenue. Like, let me think about this. Maybe I need to pass this by an attorney or someone that knows this um, and to make sure that, that this is okay, that this isn't gonna run afoul of um, IRS rules. Or if, if it does, if, 
or in some certain circumstances you may have to pay um, tax on those on that generating that revenue um, and this has come up for a lot of clients because clients are looking for innovative ways to generate revenue um, and they don't necessarily want to conform to the oh I'm just getting grants I'm just getting donations and I'm just asking people constantly for money you know I want to be able to, to diversify my revenue stream um, and we have this we have produce we have a product that we can sell um, so it, it comes up a lot um, so there's a bunch of there's a couple tests that the um, that the IRS uses when deciding whether something um, is related to or unrelated and that's related to your exempt purposes um, I kind of boiled it down to these factors because it's a little bit complicated and we could um, spend an entire workshop talking about it so generally the rule is it's not about how you it's not about how you use the money you generate it's how you generated the money so um, that's kind of what you want to think about so if you are doing say you have a urban farm and there you have a friend that has a coffee business and he's like oh I'm getting all this coffee in like do you want some I'm gonna I have this big supplier I want to do you want to you know just bag it and put your logo on it and sell it and get some money for the nonprofit you have to go that doesn't really sound like it's related to you know urban agriculture and educational activities that we're doing that that's pretty unrelated so that's going to be a problem um, but say that you are growing lots of tomatoes and jalapeno peppers and you decide that you want to make salsa and brand it with your logo and sell it also could be slightly problematic but if say you wanted to do it through cooking class demonstrations and you wanted to use unemployed youth in order to teach them how to make salsa and teach them how to you know can things and label things and that's part of an educational program then you're generating revenue that's related to your purpose um, and so you want to make sure that what you're doing how you make the money is actually um, related to the to the exam purpose even if you're doing amazing things with the money you generate so if you sell the coffee and you put it back into now I have scholarships to offer people for urban agriculture classes that's great but it's still unrelated income so you're gonna have to um, you may have to pay taxes on it or if it reaches a certain level um, your tax exemption is going to be um, at risk so you want to right so you want to make sure that the activity is reasonable in comparison to the organization's overall activities so if you really are just starting to look like an urban farm that is just producing and selling and producing and selling um, and you don't have other activities or other you're not really generating other revenue from grants or foundations or donors um, then it's going to start looking a lot more like a business and less like a nonprofit so in that um, salsa example if you have students come in you're teaching them you know business side of it labeling marketing whatever um, cooking you could then sell the salsa and that profit would be related mm -hmm. okay. yeah yeah if that's was if that was your exempt purpose originally to yeah And I would still have other activities too. If you can. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. So you always want to make sure that your activities, again, are not um, are not conferring undue benefits on um, an insider. So you're making sure that um, someone's not personally benefiting from this. Um, so if you have, if you're making your salsa and you're buying your jars from your one of your directors or something, um, making sure that you know they're not. That what your that relationship is in the best interest of the organization, not in the best interest only of the um, of the person who's profiting from it. Um, whether the activity is commercial in nature is is, a, is, is one to talk about um, because of the nature of urban agriculture. Because um, it's a farm, so it's going to look a lot like a farm that is a commercial farm. So you have to be able to differentiate um, yourself from for-profit farms right so again this is kind of similar to the um, 
comparison to the organization's overall activities. Um, you want to make sure that your revenue is, is diverse, that you're not making all of your money on those salsa sales. Um, and how... Well, you have educational activities, you have programs, um, say you have workers on the farm that are in a, like a job placement or, um, program. So job, pla job training or programs have a lot of, uh, you want to think about a few things. So are you teaching people how to do something and then you're not, a, you're not um, giving them a job afterwards. They have to be, you know, moved along. So if they, so there was the example of um, like Ben and Jerry's has a, uh, like a training uh, retail store. So yes, it looks like an ice cream store, but the, they were bringing in people that were unemployed. They were training them how to do retail activities. There was no understanding that they were going to get a job afterwards and they had to leave after a certain amount of time. Uh, and that looks like a job training program rather than just a commercial retailer. Does that make sense? Um, and then how often the activity is carried on. If you're um, setting up like a, a stand, a farm stand every week, that's a lot different than if you are setting up a farm stand to sell some of your produce um, during a, uh, like a special event. There's like an urban agriculture showcase and we're talking about farms um, in the city and once a year and you set up a little stand to sell some food, um, then that's going to be fine. But if you're doing it every week, then you might start, you're going to start looking like a, a for-profit business. So. Um, like the farm, oh good, yeah. Is it helpful to think of these different items as essentially individual sliders and you can compensate for the value of one? Yeah, the, I this mean, is... The Ben and Jerry store sounds like it's open permanently. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's open, exactly. It's very much like a business, but they have all these other sliders yeah, that they've it's, dialed up. Right, it's so very, compensate. very facts and circumstances related and right, exactly. You can offset certain things with other types of activities and um, it's, I think the point really is that this is not something that you can, well, um, <laughs> that you can start doing lightly. You need to really talk to, about it with an attorney or talk about it with an accountant who knows nonprofit um, regulations and laws. Um, so there might be ways that you can kind of change a program in order to, to make sure it doesn't look as much like a commercial activity. Um, and I have a couple example, other examples that I think it might be helpful to run through. Okay, so um, some, so okay, so you have this nonprofit farm. You're doing de cooking demonstration classes. Um, the class costs five dollars, um, but you know that's under market value. Great, um, your your nonprofit's about teaching kids something. Our nutrition classes. Okay, that's all within your exempt purpose. You can charge people, even if you charge them. $10, probably fine. Um, nonprofit Farms is one of my clients. Nonprofit Farm has a farm stand in a low-income community that has little access to fresh food. So they grow, farm, they grow food in a low-income area. They set up little corner farmers markets, just them, um, where there's little access to food. Um, they sell it at below market rate. Um, they use students, um, or they use uh, youth, and they teach them how to uh, run farm stands and how the business side of it and they um, pay them in the wage. Um, so that's going to be fine. But if you're setting up a farm stand and in New York we have the like, Union Square Farmers Market where there's you know 30, 40 farmers that come and sell their food every day. And so if you're setting up a farm stand there, you're going to be competing with commercial farms and it's going to be very hard for you to say, oh this is a nonprofit and we're not competing. So um, that you, they're able to kind of abide by the regulations because they're in a, in a low income community, because they don't have much access to fresh food, um, because they're using it as a training tool. Um, farm tours, like so if your farm offers um, school tours and they pay you know, a fee to come to the, for the visit, it's pretty nominal, you're gonna be, you're gonna be okay generating that kind of revenue. Um, okay, right, if your farm stands now in an affluent neighborhood um, that has access to fresh food and you're on the same corner as Whole Foods. Now you're competing, so you're going to have an issue 
um, claiming that you're um, serving your exempt purposes. This is a big one that's become, maybe because I've been wedding planning or something, that <laughs> like everyone has a farm wants to have a wedding on it, so, because there's a lot of money there, and people, you know, pay these kinds of things. Um, so you're charging a $1,000 site use fee um, for a wedding. That is not related to your exempt purpose. Um, and it might be okay, but you're gonna probably have to pay taxes on it. Um, so just be aware of that. And then, um, again, the farmer's farm produces an added value to sell product to sell at a farmer's market. And we talked about the salsa example and the ways to make sure to, to produce the added value product and sell it in a way that um, would fulfill your exempt for purposes um, without making it look like a commercial venture. So, do you know of any examples where people think of a condition where actually separating these two operations could be useful for an organization? So, separating the not profit side from what might be more in a commercial revenue generating? Yeah, and I have slides about that, which I'm not going to get to because this went, this is, we're tough on time right now. But yeah, you can do like a subsidiary type um, situation, or you can do a joint venture with a for profit. Where, um, sometime, where you create another entity that um, does the for-profit operations. Um, and depending on how you set up that entity, um, you can, some, and if it's, still, if it's still fulfilling your exempt purposes, you might not have to pay taxes on it, but if it's not, then you will have to pay taxes on it, but the revenue can be used to support the nonprofit. Um, can I move on, <laughs> sorry. I just wanna get to a couple things. I'm just gonna go through this pretty quickly. Um, you, can also, you can also be an unincorporated association. So um, you don't have, that means you don't get limited liability, your assets are um, you know, su subject to possible lawsuits and things like that. Um, but it's, it's more flexible, There's, you don't have to do as much, um, you don't have to abide by a lot of the, the laws that the state um, puts on nonprofits. Um, and some can qualify for tax exemption, but it's difficult and I've never really seen it. And in order to get tax exemption, you have to have so many things in place anyway that it just makes sense to, to incorporate and get the tax exemption. Um, you can have presumed tax exemption if you're under 5,000, but you still need to file the 990. All right, so for profits. Um, there are a lot of options. Uh, my little running man is because people get overwhelmed by them and there um, are a, a lot of different um, ways that you can set up a for-profit corporation. The main things you're looking at, again, are limited liability and the way that the corporation is taxed. Um, so in order to decide what's right for you, you really need to talk to an accountant um, or a tax lawyer um, so that they can look at, you know, your compare your income taxes as well to make sure okay this is what's going to be best for you and this is what's going to be um, best for meeting the goals that you want to meet so partner sole proprietorship and partnership they don't have limited liability um, the LLC does there's this low profit liability company that um, and we'll talk about that in a second corporation we'll talk about benefit corporations um, and then there's the co-ops so the hybrid entities are getting really popular. A lot of states are passing laws about um, these type, to create these types of entities. The L3C uh, is a low profit limited liability corporation. Um, so that means that you can consider other things than just the profit of the, um, of, of the corporation. You can actually take into consideration the community benefits and the environmental benefits. And you can make decisions that say, this might cost the company money, but it's better for the environment. And I don't have to worry about um, people suing me for not doing what's in the best interest of the bottom line. Um, there's been questions about the L3C about why it's even necessary. So in North Carolina, they actually um, just abolished it because they because you can write that type of thing into an LLC agreement, operating agreement anyway. So there's not really it's kind of confusing like to why even create this other entity. So North Carolina did away with it. Um, benefit corporations are the um, same thing. You can consider more than just the bottom line. You don't have to worry about shareholders suing you. Um, and that's, we call them B Corps. Um, it's a little bit different than, there's a B Corp that a, a state has adopted and said, this is a legal entity, you can be a B Corp. And then there's a nonprofit called B Labs, which actually certifies B Corporations, which people get confused about. One's the legal entity, one's the certification. Um, and so Right? Like yeah, exactly, exactly. And so, and there, so the L3C is, 
the hope was that you were going to go after program related investments from um, foundations. So foundations have to, you know, make investments and have to um, spend certain amounts of money. They were the hope was that they could then tap into that program related investment. There's been a lot of there hasn't been a lot of um, guidance from the IRS about whether that the, those that arrangement is okay or not. So a lot of foundations have been hesitant to use um, to to give money to L, to invest in L3Cs. Um, but the other reason to do it is um, just for the, you're advertising yourself as caring about your community and care about your environment. Um, and that can be good as far as like a PR standpoint. So some people do it for that reason too. Um, but it's a good way to say, you know, I care about the environment and I care about social justice, but I also want to have a corporation and I want to make some money um, and that's fine. So these hybrid entities are a, an interesting way of doing that. Um, Those are all recognized by IRS and the feds. This is all state. All this state is state. state yes. Board. Yes. Right. So you have to make sure you know what's um, what's available in your state. Maryland was the first state to have B corps. Right. Right. DC has them as well. DC has. There's a bunch that have them, but I think Maryland was the first one. And I just they're not tax exempt. Mm -hmm. No. No. <coughs> yeah. This is the all right. So. Um, and cooperatives are another great option. Um, it really decentralizes the decision-making process um, and it makes it much more democratic. Um, they tend to be better for, they tend to make better environmental decisions and better um, decisions for the communities. Um, and they, and whether you can set up a cooperative and how to set it up is very much based on your state law. So um, I'm not gonna get into that because I really wanna take time to do employment law. Okay, so partnerships for, between for-profit and non-profit organizations, there can take a, several different forms. So if you are, have a private corporation and you're making tons of money, but you wanna do some great social justice and other programs, then you can set out for private foundation. Um, and that's something like Newman's Own, you know, that makes like the salad dressings. Like they have a private foundation, they do a lot of great things. Um, joint ventures, we talked about that just briefly about the question about um, separating working with for-profits and maybe creating a separate entity uh, or having a um, subsidiary affiliated organization. So like one of my clients has a farm that they were just commercial farm, but then they started doing all these internship type programs and they started teaching people a lot and they spent, they're spending so much time doing education that they decided that they wanted to really set up a nonprofit to do that type of work. So they set up a nonprofit that does um, teaches people how to farm, has internships, um, really goes after urban farmers to, to, to be able to teach them how to, the skills that they need to then go back to their cities and um, be able to implement those farming practices. Um, so they're affiliated because they work on the, there's not really a great term for this, so I call it affiliated, but um, they, as long as they have an agreement between them that lines up, the, the, um, that explains their relationship, and they have, and they're governed by separate things. So the owners of the farm can't be the board, of, can be on the board of directors, but often have to um, excuse themselves or recuse themselves um, from certain decisions. But they can work closely together. So, and we have like Brooklyn Grange is a big rooftop farm in um, New York that a lot of people have heard on, heard of, and they're for profit. But then they have a nonprofit brand arm, which is City Growers, and they do a lot of their education um, initiatives through the city growers. Um, and that type of relationship is okay um, as long as um, the for-profit is not um, unduly benefiting from the, from the for-profit's activities. Okay. okay, I do really wanna talk about employment law because it comes up so much and it's actually one of the highest areas of risks for um, for-profits and non-profits. Um, the Department of Labor and um, you know the IRS are really going going after um, people for for their internship programs um, for their independent contractors and so I just wanted to general just go over this kind of briefly um, for profits you can use volunteers generally um, you have to be careful uh, in some situations where you're using volunteers for commercial activity. Um, and like in a thrift store or something like that, that you generally should be paying them minimum wage and making sure that you're abiding by employment laws. Um, you can have intern programs in both nonprofits and for-profits, but it has to be educational. 
Um, you really need to be doing it for the benefit of the intern, not for you. So they can't be your coffee gopher um, all the time. They can do it maybe a little bit, but generally it has to be there for their education. Um, you should really set up curriculum for them so that they have, so that there's something that you can, you know, if there's a question about your internship program, say, this, look, this is what we're teaching them how to do. Um, they're really benefiting. We're like incidentally benefiting from them being here. Um, for profits cannot use volunteers. I cringe so many times. I talk to for-profit urban farms, and they say, "Oh, we're having a work day. We're having people come and weed and garden." It's like, no, no, you cannot do that. Um, so, if you want to use volunteers, you cannot be a for-profit. Um, and then there's always this independent contractors versus employees question, um, because a lot of people want to main people. Uh, independent contractors because it's cheaper for them. They don't have to pay as many taxes. Um, they don't have to report on them. They don't have to abide by a lot of employment laws. But it's something that the IRS is very much going, or Department of Labor is very much going after. Um, so you need to make sure that you're classifying them the correct way. And a lot of times that means going to an employment law specialist or an attorney or some HR specialist. So a lot of, it's really about the right of control and how much control you have over the person. And there's a couple different tests again, but these are just the main things you want to think about. So if you um, have control over their behavior, do they require a lot of instruction and training and supervision, um, then they're probably an employee, not an, a, not an independent contractor. Um, financial control, do you have, um, are you paying for their business expenses? That's an indicator of an employee. Are there services available to the public? Like, are they a bookkeeper and they do this for five different organizations? Then they're more of an independent contractor. Um, how do you pay them? Are you paying them per on a project basis? Um, then they look like an independent contractor. But if you're paying them hourly, you're starting to look more like an employee. And again, these are facts and circumstances, and other things can balance each other out. Um, and the realization of profit and loss. So um, that would be if the organization, if the contractor is getting just a certain set amount of money, or if um, and and then they're if they don't if they have to spend more money in order to make to fulfill the project, um, then that's their own loss. Then that is more of an independent contractor. Um, permanency, if they're going to be there for a long period of time employee, short period of time, uh, independent contractor, employee benefits, um, providing key services to the business. I've, tried to, I've seen people try to put their executive directors as independent contractors. Yeah, like, no, you can't do that. Like, you're clearly making decisions about the organization, managing the organization. You're not an independent contractor. You're an employee. Um, and this comes back to bite you a lot of times when people apply for unemployment insurance. You have to list everywhere you've ever worked before. And the Department of Labor will go and check it out and say, oh, this was an employee, not an independent contractor. We're going to fine you, and also we're going to audit you a lot. <laughs> so um, really important to start off on the right foot and make sure you're classifying people the right way. And I have to go. Sorry. <laughs> um, I just want to thank her for presenting me. Um, I just want to make sure that I make it to the best time. So yeah.